Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the fourth child of Bill Cornwall Bird Jr. and Ethlyn Annetta Brown Bird. My three older siblings, Yelena, Darren, and Kim, were born in England when my parents were studying. My father studied law, and my mother became a registered nurse and midwife. They had a boy, two boys before me, and they automatically thought for some reason that the next child was going to be a girl. My parents were going to name me Verena. <laughs> Thank God Papa Bird came along and heard that name, thought that I was a male, and said, no, call him Veer. He was born in Antigua. I'll, give him, I'll save him from that one. The shock of my father's rapid passing has no, not fully settled on the minds of my family and those who have known and come to love him. At this point in time, we find the greatest comfort in knowing that Veer Cornell Burr Jr. left a glowing legacy on those that knew him, loved him, and the many that he graciously assisted in whatever form which he willingly did for the many people that came seeking aid. To his brothers and sisters who knew him the longest, I'd like to say that Dad loved you all, 12, with all his heart. There were times that I would hear him on the phone talking to several of you over the years, and it was like he was talking to a child instead of a grown man or woman with a family of their own, and in some cases already collecting a pension. I won't reveal those names. I believe he felt, as the eldest male sibling in the family, that he was the protector and the one to provide comfort and guidance to his siblings. You have lost the best brother that you could ever have. For the 76 years, five months, and five days that dad was here on earth, he has always played a part in the Antiguan Barbarian Society. He was a member of the Methodist Junior Choir, one of the first to have a mass troop in Antigua's first carnival. I think the first one was called Cowboys, and the second one troop was called Pageant of Siena, and they actually won the competition. He had a great love for the sports, especially cricket and track and field. He served as president of both the National Olympic Committee and the Special Olympic Committee. My dad was no musician, but he had great love for steel band music and supported and sponsored Ebonite Steel Orchestra from Otters. From its inception to their greatest heights when they won Panorama in the late 1970s, he was a sponsor for many Calypsonians and gave me one of the best musical educations in classical music and counterpoint that was available in New York during my adolescence. The greatest act of love and concern for the people of this country was not what Weber Jr. did whilst in public office, what I saw him do on a daily basis after the 24th of March 2004 when he lost his seat in the rural South constituency. The desire of my father to continue guiding and assisting those in need in his law chambers on a daily basis without key or concern for financial gain or public recognition speaks to his character as one who had no desire for power as a sole purpose in a political career that started in 1976. What Dr. Lake was talking about really, I'll fill you in a little bit more detail. As a little boy, I was born in 1971. And when we were living under the Fraisler State House, I remember as a little boy, Daisy, my, my nanny Daisy, Samuel from Seaview Farm used to take care of me. Usually I like to sleep with her. And I saw in the east bedroom my grandfather used to sleep. I saw my father yanking him out of bed. Day in day or trying to pull him out of bed. He's always in his pajamas, you know. He was going through his um, depression there. You see, the birds are originally from Grace Farm, Green Bay area. Theophilus Granville Bird. And I believe in that 71 election, his heart was broken. And he went through a little bout of depression there. I saw my father trying to grab him out, pull him out of the bed. He was in his pajamas. And he was telling him, you're younger than Churchill. You're younger than De Gaulle. You need to get up and get out of your bed and go face your people. You know, he wasn't doing it that well. The attempts seemed to have been failing. What happened? My mother and Daisy Samuel we were in her bedroom eating our breakfast. And Kim and Dar, my elder brothers, climbed up on the wardrobe in Papa Bird's bedroom and jumped off the, off the wardrobe onto his bed. And the mom and them said, get out of your, your, your grandfather's room. But they gave us the eye. They gave us a wink. 
And from then on, for the next week, we kept climbing up on that wardrobe and jumping off on his bed continuously, continuously. So what happened that we broke a couple of the, the, the wood, wooden boards, not a spring or anything. It was some wooden boards underneath. We broke a couple of those boards. And I must say that in the 1976 election, after he won it, Brandon stopped living with us. He never came back. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last time I lived with my grandfather. As a husband and father, dad had many flaws, but none that mom and my siblings did not forgive him. I had the benefit of being with him during his last days and hours, and was there to, to hug and kiss him during his final moments on earth, which has given me the peace of mind and comfort to cope with my grief during these trying times. For the short time that I had with him, my father this year, trying to diagnose his illness, my only regret is that I wish I could have been, made his passing easier. Had I known the gravity of dad's illness, I would like to have been a better son to him by easing even by an hour, minute, or second the pain that he suffered in this world. He was deserving of that. For someone like Weber Jr., who had suffered in life many disappointments, rejections, disrespect, and slanders upon his name, most hurtful to him were when it was by his comrades in the Antigua Labor Party, to which he remained loyal for no particularly good reason. They were gambling in the synagogue at 46 North Street when Bear Bird Jr. received $30,000 in total from his beloved ALP to fight the general election in 2004. This caused the ALP one of the largest, most loyal, and organized constituencies. I believe the check, the memo, had on it yours in comradeship when they gave it to him. They were gambling in the synagogue at 46 North Street when New Labor rigged the recent branch elections for delegates. They were gambling in the synagogue at 46 North Street when New Labour rigged the party convention on the 25th of November 2012. We are taught as children that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, instructed his followers that when a person strikes you on one cheek, that you should give them the other cheek to strike. My father's greatest flaw in life was that too many times when he was struck on the cheek, he did, in fact, offer the other cheek to his political opponents. Even Jesus, towards the end of his life on earth, when he saw wrong, instead of turning the other cheek, chose to cast out the wrongdoers for gambling in the synagogue, an act which ultimately cost him his life. My father, Weber Jr., was a man of peace. I remember the incidents with Taffy Bufton. My father was in his chambers, and in his chambers he was shot in midday in the face by Mr. Bufton, who was a client of his. And rumor was that my father was supposed to have done some shenanigans with Mr. Bufton, or that he wasn't getting proper representation. But to lawyers who are here today, we know the issue of eminent domain has been settled since 1606 in the King Progress in Saul Peter's case, where the King of England, in times of war, went into people's houses on their private property in order to get the Saul Peter to build munitions to defend the realm. That is the first time it has been settled that even if Mr. Bufton was going to be compensated, he had no say in the government taking away his property. That was decided over four or five hundred years ago. But for some reason, the impression is out there that Veer Bird Jr. did something wrong in his relations with his client, Mr. Bufton. All my father I know would have done would have gone about getting him the most money possibly could have gotten from this government and moved on to build a better, more prosperous Antiguan Barbuda for the development of Guana Island. And for that, he was shot in the face. Even when they brought the ambulance down to Long Street, they took up the white man and my father had to go and get a car to carry him to the hospital. That is the reality of the situation. But otherwise than that, I believe he forgave Mr. Bufton and life goes on. I remember one occasion when I was down at North Street, I heard a certain comrade said that they took up $8 million and lost it on the New York Stock Exchange. They were not the treasurer, and they were not even a parliamentary representative. And I came back from, from um, studies and I said, what, $8 million to fly around like that? How is that possible? My father told me, if I asked questions and I told him what was going on, and I went and told him about it, that might mean that the Antigua Labour Party would cease to exist. So he was a man of peace, and he let 
eight million dollar slide by without questioning. I know of another situation with the nonsense that took place on the 25th of November 2012 at the convention. My father was the first one to congratulate the new leader of the Antigua Labour Party. My sister Elena, when he was in New York, he went up to New York in December. And my elder sister right here asked him, but dad, you know that is all wrong. How can you support that? My father said, I saw that there was a splintering in the party, and I believe if I said something pos positive, it would heal the party. And that was the sort of man he was, even though he knew it was wrong. The old Roman maxim is what my father should have followed. Que desiderate pacem prepare bellum. He who desires peace must prepare for war. There were none braver, none kinder, and none that personally gave so much of themselves in political life than Veer Bird Jr. My father, towards the end of his life, chose to speak out against the wrongdoers and potentially cast them out of his synagogue at 46 North Street. On his return to Antigua in mid-February, he told me that he would never go back down to 46 North Street. The week before he died, he told me that he was ready to campaign with me when I am ready. And he told Cindy, his secretary, to round up 20 of his supporters in rural south to start hitting the campaign trail, which we promised him on his deathbed we will do. Jesus was not a Christian. He was born and died a Jew. However, his followers, who were also initially members of the Jewish religion, chose not to fall in line with the high priests of the synagogue or the Roman Empire, and chose instead to become followers of Christ. As a Christian, we are taught from childhood that through the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, that we are given the gift of eternal life. Now, I'm not certain that would ever want to be playing a harp on a white cloud based on the depictions of what heaven is like in early religious artwork. My view is that my father has done enough good to his fellow man during his 76 years on earth, and that heaven to him would be anywhere that he would, could assist people and give them some form of comfort and support, wherever that may be. When you look out to women at the common man in the street, and they have concerns about their mortgage, their rent, educating their children, putting food on their table, the common man in the street has lost a true champion who fought for their cause. I pray and hope that the good Lord Jehovah grants dad the eternal peace that he so rightly deserves. Thank you very much.